Here is the fourth video presentation on Hot Mix Asphalt Paving Inspection. We'll look at joint construction, compact requirements, rolling principles and procedures, density and coring, final surface checks, and pavement markings. The purpose of rolling is to leave the Hot Mix Asphalt courses sufficiently dense and smooth, and to give the top course a pleasing appearance with no roller marks or unevenness. In part one, we talked about the requirements for rollers, along with the other equipment used in hot mix asphalt paving operations. So you already know that it takes a combination of rollers using the correct frequency and amplitude settings used skillfully to successfully compact the hot mix asphalt pavement courses. All areas of the HMA courses must be properly compacted, but the joints deserve special attention. In part three, we talked about constructing longitudinal joints, and we talked about coming off the transverse joint to begin paving. Now let's look at both the construction and compaction of transverse joints. A transverse joint must be constructed when paving stops at the end of a run, or at the end of the day or when it's discontinued long enough for the surface temperature of the new mat to fall below 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Transverse joints and all courses must be carefully constructed and thoroughly compacted to provide a smooth riding surface. There are several ways to construct transverse joints. There are construction joints, butt joints, and feathered joints. There are also joints that match HMA pavements to concrete slabs. Butt and feathered joints are used to connect new pavement to existing pavement. If a butt joint is not specified, then a feathered joint should be used. To make a feathered joint, the paver starts out with the screed set flush with the existing roadway. The thickness of the mix is gradually increased at the rate of 1 inch per 35 feet or more until the desired mat thickness is reached. The joint is then trimmed to a neat line to meet existing conditions. Large stones in the first 3 feet of the joint are removed by raking, leaving the fine material in place. Open texture areas in the joint are filled using mix from which the large stones have been removed. The breakdown rolling of the joint is then completed. The most common type is the transverse construction joint, or night joint, built with the ramp. When the last load of mix is in the hopper and the paver only has a few feet to go before the material falls below the auger shaft, the paving is stopped and the paver is removed from the roadway. The breakdown rolling is completed to the end of the mat for the full width of the lane. The roller moves back to continue rolling. A string line is placed across the mat at right angle to the center line, about three feet back from the end. The mat is cut along the string line with a shovel and the material between the string at the end of the mat is removed and saved. The face of the cut is then shaped with a lute until it's straight and vertical all the way across the mat. Burlap or paper is then placed to cover the vertical face of the joint and the base of the roadway for a distance from the joint equal to 5 feet for each 1 inch of mat thickness. For example, 10 feet for a 2 inch mat. Mix salvaged earlier is placed on the paper or burlap and against the joint. Material is then placed to construct the ramp from the cut joint to the base. The rolling is then completed on the surface and the ramp. Keep in mind that night joints must be made well enough to carry traffic safely and without damage to the end of the mat. 
Do not allow the contractor to waste any excess material past the construction joint and into the existing roadway. Make sure all the excess is completely removed. Before paving resumes, the ramp must be removed. Then the paper or burlap is removed. See that all the material is removed from the base and the face of the joint. At this time, the surface of the mat is typically straight edged to see if there are no dips in the existing pavement. A 10 foot straight edge should be placed parallel to the center line in each wheel track and at the approximate center of the lane. It should be flush with the surface along its entire length. If you're unfamiliar with the straight edging procedure, refer to the construction manual. When straight edging reveals dips in the mat, the contractor must establish a new joint line. Remove all the pavement in front of it. Bond coat the base and joint face and start paving from there. Meanwhile, the paver screed is heated. Shims that are equal in height to the uncompacted material are placed on the mat. The screed is lowered onto the shims and the thickness control is adjusted. Mix is placed in the paver hopper and fed to the proper height around the auger. The paver should start moving away from the joint very slowly. The mix along the transverse joint is then butted into a vertical face with a loot. You should check the mat texture, crown, and depth immediately. Rolling can then begin in a transverse direction. The roller first pinches the joint in about four to six inches of the new mat across the lane. Rolling in this direction is continued until about a three foot strip of fresh mat has been compacted, the roller advancing about six inches with each pass. You should then check the joint at several points with a 10 foot straight edge to ensure that the transition from the existing surface to the new mat is smooth. If any corrective action is needed, be sure the work is done before the fresh material cools. Now when hot mix asphalt paving adjoins either a concrete slab or a gutter pan, make sure that the HMA surface is one quarter inch high after rolling. And it's especially important when making a transverse joint abutting a concrete slab. Another situation that demands great care is the construction of HMA pavement on an aggregate base adjoining a slab or a curb. These sections tend to settle and be too low after a short time. All the more reason to run a ski grade reference along the gutter pan for proper control during paving. For now, that's joint construction. Next, we'll look at compaction requirements. For the size, type, and number of rollers the contractor uses will depend on the method of paving, the production rate of the mix, and the hot mix asphalt course being placed. In addition, the use of rollers depends on the phase or stage of rolling, breakdown, intermediate, or finish. Rollers must meet the following requirements. Pneumatic tire rollers must be self-propelled. They are equipped with a minimum of seven wheels situated on the axles, such that the rear group of tires will not follow the tracks of the forward group, but are spaced to provide a minimum tire path overlap of one half inch. The tires are smooth and capable of being inflated to the pressure recommended by the roller's manufacturer. Pneumatic rollers leave the top course pavement free of excessive globules of mixture after rolling. The rollers are equipped with a mechanism capable of reversing the motion of the rollers smoothly. 
Also, the rollers are equipped with wheel scrapers and have skirting to enclose the wheel area within three inches of the pavement surface. A release agent is used to prevent the material from sticking to the tires. A pneumatic tire roller must be used for initial compaction of the first course placed on a rubbleized base or existing pavement. The rubber tires knead into the mix into all holes and depressions for better density. Pneumatic tired rollers must not mark or rut the surface or displace the pavement edges. Steel wheeled rollers are self-propelled vibratory or static tandem rollers or self-propelled static three-wheeled rollers. The steering device responds readily and permits the roller to be directed on the alignment desired. Roller wheels are smooth and free from openings or projection which will mar the surface of the pavement. When there is a transverse joint, the first step is to complete the compaction of the transverse joint. Breakdown rolling should start close to the paver and at the highest temperature possible without picking up the mat. The construction manual shows the general pattern for breakdown rolling. Keep in mind that a roll or pass is a two-way movement down and back in the same path. In other words, to complete a pass, a roller rolls both toward the paver and away from the paver along the same path before moving over to begin the next pass. Then when a single lane is being paved, with no abutting lane or structure, the edges should be rolled in the next two passes. It's best to roll the lower edge first, especially on super elevated sections. The roller wheel should overhang the edge slightly. After the outer edges are rolled, the center portion of the lane should be compacted with as many passes as necessary to completely cover the mat. When the lane being paved abuts a structure, or a previously placed lane forming a vertical longitudinal joints, it should be rolled first, such as along the gutter or where the fresh mat abuts a lane placed earlier. An adjoining lane should be placed so that it uniformly overlaps the first lane by one to two inches. A worker should bump the overlapping mix with a loot back to the edge of the hot lane. This way the roller will compress the small excess into the hot side of the joint. If the overlap is excessive, the material should not be spread across the new surface. It should be removed. If a vibratory roller is used, be sure that it's operated in the static mode to avoid damaging the previous lane. You can see a longitudinal vertical joint being made, but once it's rolled, it should be nearly undetectable. Compact the transverse joint first, followed by the longitudinal joint, then the free edge of the mat, and finally the center of the lane. Next, intermediate rolling continues this process by using four principles for achieving compaction. Static weight, kneading action, impact, and vibration. The number of rollers used and number of passes will vary by the type of mix and the lift thickness. Hot mix asphalt compacts at high frequency and low amplitude. Amplitude is the distance the drum lifts off the ground, and frequency is the number of drum impacts per minute, also designated as VPM, vibrations per minute. Vibratory rollers have an automatic shutoff to deactivate the vibrators when the roller speed is less than 0.5 miles per hour. They operate according to the manufacturer's recommendations for speed, impacts per foot, and amplitude of vibration for the thickness of the HMA being compacted. A vibratory compactor should never exceed the rate that will provide less than one impact of the drum 
per inch of travel. Finish or final rolling is done solely for improving the surface. It should be done while the mat is still warm enough for the finish roller to remove any marks left by the other rollers. In compacting base courses, keep in mind that the mix is usually placed in greater thicknesses than for leveling or top courses. This means longer heat retention, which allows more roller coverage before the temperature required for optimum impaction falls too low. Now for some rules of rolling and tips on what to look for when you inspect compaction operations. First, rollers must move at a slow, uniform speed to avoid displacing the mix. The roller should change direction smoothly, without backlash. The operator should always make the transition from one pass to the next, gradually over a long section. Avoid sharp turns that will cut the mat. At the end of a pass, when reversing direction, turn the roller into a slight curve prior to stopping to avoid leaving a transverse ridge across the mat. And subsequent reversals should cover the earlier ones, trying to leave no marks at all. Another practice to avoid is parking the roller on the fresh mat, but if it has to be done, position the roller on an angle. Parking on a warm mat will most likely cause an indentation that will not roll out. Of course, it's much better to park entirely off the mat being paved, or where the mat has cooled sufficiently. Roller wheels should be kept free of mix by properly functioning sprinklers, mats, and scraper bars. If the roller wheels pick up mix anyway, hold off rolling that portion of the mat until it cools slightly. Be sure that areas where pickup occurs, or where paving defects appear, are satisfactorily repaired and re-rolled sufficiently. Be aware that lumps of mix dropped by rollers on the mat will cool off, and if rolled into the surface may pop out later, under additional rolling or traffic. Now, just as pavers can't reach every area that has to be paved, rollers can't always roll every area that needs to be compacted. Hand rollers, such as this one, are needed in areas that rollers can't reach. Hand tampers are needed to compact the mix around structure covers. Mechanical vibrating compactors must be used in other hard-to-compact areas. And in part three, you saw the required use of a roller attached to the paver to compact the bottom taper of longitudinal tapered joints. For safety, be sure that each roller operates with a warning beacon. The placing and compacting operations should be planned so that the work can be completed during daylight, unless night operations have been authorized. As inspector, you need to ensure that finish rolling continues until all roller marks are eliminated. It's a standard specification requirement that each layer of hot mix asphalt be compacted to the required density. It's the contractor's responsibility to achieve minimum density through quality control. This is done by correlation of the nuclear gauge testing and taking an informational core at the startup of production. The contractor will be allowed to take the information for quality control testing as approved by the engineer. Density is determined by taking core samples. The location of each core is determined by the engineer using a random number generating calculator. The core locations for each sub lot are based on longitudinal and transverse measurements rather than tonnage. The contractor is not to know the site of the core location until the site has been marked. The site is marked with a 2 inch diameter paint die, which represents the center of the core. For quality assurance, these core samples must be 6 inches in diameter. 
The inspector must ensure the chain of custody of QA cores by witnessing the coring, taking immediate possession of the core, properly labeling the core, and documenting these steps. 4E10 level. MDOT's personnel must handle these cores in a secure manner to avoid any damage, including the transport to the testing lab. During startup operations, the contractor sets up a roller pattern to attain minimum quality control density. The final core results will determine the pavement density. Besides density, there are ride quality specifications and smoothness requirements that the finished hot mix asphalt courses must meet. After final rolling, the surface may be tested longitudinally at selected locations with a 10-foot straight edge. The variation of the surface from the two ends of the straight edge must not exceed the limits at any point. For hot mix asphalt base course mixtures, there should be no more than a 3 quarter inch gap for the lower layer of base courses, and no more than a 3 8 inch gap for the final layer of base courses. And for leveling and top courses used in multiple course construction, no more than a quarter inch for lower courses, and no more than an eighth of an inch for the top courses. Finally, pavement markings. Since so many of our paving projects must be carried out under traffic, this is an important responsibility, along with the other aspects of traffic control. Temporary markings include these edge and lane lines placed after the final rolling of a leveling course. The worker places four foot strips of reflective tape to form the temporary skip lines. After the top course on this resurfacing job is finally rolled, permanent markings are placed. In urban areas, the markings include crosswalk lines and legend and stop bars, as well as lane lines and center lines. The work may include removing old or temporary markings before the new markings are placed. Different marking materials, methods, and tools may be employed by the contractor but the markings themselves are specified on the plans or in the proposal for the project, along with their locations and spacing. Here the longitudinal alignments have been marked on the surface to guide the placement of the solid yellow lines and parallel skip lines. Let's look at the key steps and concerns. First, the locations and spacing of the markings have to be measured and marked. On an intersecting street, a set of solid center lines plus a stop bar have to be placed. Then, because this is a cold surface, adhesive is applied to the pavement. Once the adhesive is set up or becomes tacky, the tape is applied. The tape is laid down carefully in the desired position and is applied without wrinkles or air bubbles. It's rolled in this case with a manually pushed roller. A roller is used to smooth the tape and make it adhere firmly to the surface. The completed stop bar is ready to serve its function. And now the completed hot mix asphalt pavement is ready to serve its function. Your work as an HMA paving inspector is reflected in the high quality roadways constructed throughout Michigan. <laughs>